Hello there. My name is Mark Brodeen. Um, I'm going to be leading this first session. So I'd like to welcome everybody to this series about strengthening our collective ability to implement the party program to uh, take our general strategy and apply it in the changing world around us. So um, my session is on Marxist strategy and tactics. Uh, this is uh, just sort of if you will, an introduction to the factors that go into developing particularly strategy. Um, my name is Mark Brodeen. I've been a party member for over 50 years, so I'm proud to say over half the existence of the party I've been a member. Um, I'm the chair of the Washington State Party and a member of the National Committee. Um, and I was also a nine-term treasurer of an AFSCME local. So I have experience in helping develop strategy for a local union, for a party organization. Um, and I've also uh, helped, uh, I chaired the last two committees that drafted uh, uh, our party program. In 2005, we uh, developed the first new party program in 25 years. And in, I believe it was 2019, we updated it significantly. Um, so those are some of my qualifications for starting out. Um, so there's a lot to cover, so I'll get right into it. There will be a couple of times where I ask questions or open the floor for discussion, but uh, I'm gonna try and move quickly because as I say, there's a lot to cover. So welcome everybody, and I hope you uh, gain a lot from this whole series that um, wrestling with these issues uh, while we step outside of our, you know, immediate needs, many times clubs, club meetings focus on what my my uh, former mother-in-law used to call the potato salad question: Who's bringing the potato salad? Who's doing the leaflet? What time are we starting? Who's the MC? But we have to step back from those immediate things and take a look at the broader picture. So my goals for this session are to discuss a Marxist approach to developing strategy, to clear up some semantic problems about understanding the distinction between strategy and tactics, and to clarify what our, and discuss our basic party strategy, not going into great detail, but um, giving you a, um, a snapshot into them. So why is strategy important? I'll tell you a couple of stories. Uh, one, um, uh, these are not personal stories in the sense of I was there, but personal stories in the sense of when I learned why strategy was important. One was uh, in the development, the early stages of the Free Angela Davis campaign. She was arrested and uh, there had already been a movement which she was part of to free all political prisoners. And that was the, the demand on a lot of uh, leaflets and a lot of slogans and banners. And the first assumption by some of the people doing the um, organizing of a committee to free Angela Davis was that that was going to be the main slogan, free all political prisoners. That sounded radical. It pushed the envelope. It connected Angela's case to the case of George Jackson, uh, many other uh, people who were political prisoners in one way or another. However, Henry Winston, who was the party chair at the time, played a role in convincing the committee that the first main demand should be for bail. And that was controversial because many people want free all political prisoners sounds more basic, more radical, more direct, and it gets at the heart of what of the movement that they were trying to build. Uh, the argument in response to that was that how you frame the debate matters and framing the debate such that the most people can be engaged, most people can be brought into, most people can be won whether they thought she was guilty or not, if they thought that she deserved bail, that was an entry into the struggle. And so having the fight for bail uh, be the, the central focus before the trial started was, uh, you know, some saw that as a stepping back from the most radical way of putting it, um, but the view which uh, Henry Winston advocated and which we 
adopted was that reaching out in the broadest way possible at the start of the struggle was the best way to go to build the biggest movement to have the biggest impact. So that was one lesson that how you frame things, what your strategy is, what your goal of your strategy is, has to be um, an important factor. Um, another book, uh, a book which I highly recommend is called Allende's Chile, uh, written by a member of our party, Edward Boerstein, who um, was in Chile. He was a, uh, an assistant to Allende's economic advisor. So he was a firsthand observer and participant in that. And uh, among other strategic lessons from that book, which I highly recommend, available from international publishers, was that he took on the left criticism that um, the Chilean uh, revolutionaries just didn't understand the importance of arming the people, that that's the reason why they ended up with fascism. Um, and he says, you know, they talk about this as if it was just like driving an ice cream truck down the down the street, uh, playing a uh, playing the entertainer, if you will, from the sting, and uh, handing out weapons to anyone and everyone, and that that's a that's not a serious approach to a very serious subject. And he pointed out that that criticism didn't take into account the actual balance of forces. They were on a knife's edge. They did not have a support of the majority yet. They had a foothold of state power. And their goal was to uh, gain a majority. And they were succeeding on that path. And because they were succeeding, that's that was part of the, the impetus for the why the fascist coup happened when it did happen. Uh, so the lesson from that was you have to take into account the actual balance of forces. If they had started passing out weapons willy-nilly, that would have immediately triggered a coup-like response from the military. They were in a delicate balance with the military and they had to have a strategy that advanced their winning a majority of the population without uh, providing the excuse for a coup. So that's uh, a little bit of how I learned uh, why strategy is important. Um, so I'd like to open the floor first before we dive deeper to ask you, what is your impression of what strategy is? Uh, and, um, you know, what, whether it's a dictionary definition or something from uh, your own experience. And I have Luke on the line who's helping me to moderate um, the times when there'll be time for your input. So I just want us to talk a little bit about what do you think strategy is? All right, so um, all you have to do here is press the raised hand button to raise your hand. Uh, then open your mic by pressing the red uh, mic icon. It'll turn to green, showing that your mic is open. Then I will open your mic on my end, and you can present your question. Yeah, what is strategy? Oh, what is, yeah, what is, Richard, I am uh, opening your mic. Richard, you can present your question or what your uh, opinion on strategy is. Yeah. All right. I'm going to move along. Um, Yosef, I'm unmuting you. You can open your mic and um, there you go. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Um, I come from a sort of small town and it's called Waco in Texas. Um, there's not a lot of opportunity for anything more you know, substantial, but I do volunteer work where I can. Uh, and I try and just talk with people in my local college. So that's my extensive strategy, um, I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what is the goal of that strategy? Just to try and raise awareness. That's the most that I can seem to manage at this moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there another? Looking for more hands. Um, okay. 
Richard, I'm going to unmute you again, if you can unmute yourself and present your question. It's Richard Sherry. All right. Um, looking for more raised hands. Lucas, I'm unmuting you. Uh, so for me and like the, the more general sense of like what strategy is and how I view it, um, I think of it as like a, a theory of success, um, kind of what steps do I think where if we take these, we get to our ultimate like objective. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Looking for more raised hands. Juno. I'm unmuting you. Oh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. So I I live in a state called North Carolina. I live in, in what is considered the Deep South. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of very, un, North Carolina has recently become a, it has a super majority Republican spear, but even still, I see strategy as going out in my local community and finding different groups of people that I can connect with and ultimately learning what people's goals are and being able to ulti ultimately form kind of a, a mass line and kind of get get as, get as many people in a broad sense of unity together on issues and try and or, organize people around central themes and central concepts so that so, so that when there's things that need to get done and projects and things that, that need to be done, I can, I'm able to have that broad sense of unity and have that broad sense of of togetherness. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, I'll 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 move on a little bit. I I wanted to. I know you don't want to just listen to me lecture for uh, too damn long, but I'm going to do a bit of that. But um, there's some common themes in what people have just suggested that um, strategy is a path to an ultimate objective. It starts with estimating where you're at and what's possible in the current moment, and then identifying tactics and steps to uh, move that process forward, to connect with different groups out there and figure out how to build unity so that we can move the struggle forward. The whole point of strategy is that we don't stay stuck, that we have a path that we can see towards our bigger objectives and longer term objectives. So first I wanna talk about a semantic question that I must confess confused me for years. What is a strategy and what is a tactic? What's the difference? And this can seem a semantic question, but really it's a question about scale. Uh, the strategy for a local election campaign can be a strategy for that campaign, but from the perspective of a national campaign, that's uh, barely a tactic. It won't even appear on their screens. They don't care what people in Roslyn, Washington are doing particularly about our specific circumstances. They care how it fits into the the big national picture. So for me in my local area, I'm developing strategy to change things politically for the better here in my little town and in my state, whereas a national strategy, uh, in the perspective, from a national perspective, those are just details. Those are not uh, central aspects of the strategy. So it depends, we have to understand what scale and scope we're talking about and whether we're talking about a short-term struggle or a long-term struggle. Um, and we'll go into these some more. For example, are we talking about strategy for one national election cycle or about strategy for the next 10 or 20 years of elections? Are we focused on winning a strike or are we focused on building a union over many years? Are we talking about a particular struggle or are we talking about how that relates to cultural and social change over many years? Or are we talking about big international issues of which the U.S. is just a detail, or are we focused on our own struggles? Those are the kind of 
the scopes, you know, if we're, if I'm talking about Rosalind Washington, I'm, I'm thinking about the people here, the movements here, the trends here, the culture here, uh, what society is like here. Uh, but on a national scale, that's a very different discussion because it's focused on uh, bigger issues and a bigger scale. So having an idea of scope and scale is one of the first steps in developing strategy to look at context. Uh, what is the big picture? What is uh, the base from which we're starting. And Lennon noted that the essence of strategy is correctly estimating the balance of forces. Who's on our side, who's on their side, uh, who's, who are our main allies, who are our main enemies, what splits uh, exist in the ruling class, what obstacles to unity uh, on the working class side, uh, how can we build unity on our side and uh, drive wedges into the splits on the other side. So these, the goals that we have are closely linked with scale and scope. They need to be aligned. So as I said, is our basic goal to win a particular strike or is it to give workers a sense of their own power or to build the union long term? Or is it to unite more of the labor movement using a particular struggle as a vehicle? And these are complementary goals. They're not con they're not in conflict with each other, but our strategy will vary depending on which goal and which scope we choose uh, to put in the forefront of the present moment. And we need to avoid rigid approaches to strategy and tactics. For example, in working on a particular election campaign, our goal may go way beyond that specific campaign to build broad unity, to build union-based independent electoral infrastructure, to use a campaign as a vehicle for building a lasting unity uh, for the next years. Um, so if though our goals are broad, uh, we also have to work with those who goal, whose goals are limited to that specific campaign. Broad-based unity means we have to focus on working with such forces. Our goal in participating is to win them to a broader view, but it doesn't start out that way. We have to start with them where they're at. So radicals who seek to build unity based on getting center forces to agree in advance to a radical program are doomed to failure. Sorry, that's just a cat in the background. So I'd like to give an example of this. Uh, in Seattle, um, about 10 years ago or so, uh, Sawant uh, won election to the city council as a socialist uh, based on a campaign that included the demand for raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Uh, she is a member of a group called Socialist Alternative, which is a Trotskyite grouplet, big in Seattle. Um, and after the election, her group tried to take advantage of the victory that she had had to set up a coalition to win the battle for $15 an hour. Uh, but they started it uh, trying to get people and groups to agree in advance on adopting the approach of her organization, which meant no compromise and meaning they stayed in control of the coalition. Eventually, a coalition was brought together that actually won increasing the minimum wage to $15, but that it victory involved some very heavy compromises, compromises with the restaurant industry, compromises with phasing in the wage, wage increases, compromises from the very beginning, mean, meaning negotiating with our opponents to win, to put splits into the opposition so that um, we could actually win it. I actually know somebody who talked to Sawant about this early on, who said, look, you have an approach, but if you hold it so tight, you'll never win. You'll restrict the number of people who will join a coalition based on no compromises. It's not that I was, uh, we were in disagreement with um, the goal of 
getting everybody to $15 an hour, but we never would have gotten that if we had insisted on no compromises and an instantaneous rise to $15 an hour. Those were compromises, they were heavy compromises, but they were key to winning the victory. And without those compromises, we would not have won that victory, that local victory. But that local victory, limited though it was, helped set the stage for battles all across the country. So it was important to win it, even though it was limited and compromised and uh, not everything that we would want. And if we had gone with the approach of socialist alternative, saying no compromises, instantaneous increase to fifteen dollars uh, no exceptions in any way shape or form for the restaurant industry we would have lost the battle and hence not inspired that battle across the country which has resulted in many more victories local and national this brings us to the most important strategic question what is the path to changing the balance of forces in my last example the path was winning a limited but crucial victory um, so that helped change the balance of forces it helped convince people across the country that it was a battle that could be won it helped convince them that there was a path to victory that they could join in on uh, that they could uh, take advantage of. It inspired people, for example, uh, minimum wage workers at fast food outlets to start to organize and realize they could fight for a better wage and better working conditions for themselves. This was a path for them to organize. So changing the balance of forces in that case relied on winning a victory and opening people's eyes to the fact that they had strength on their own that they could engage in the struggle. Um, and for our party and for Marxists, the goal in any struggle is not limited to that struggle. The goal always includes working to change the balance of forces. That will make further victories possible. It will connect that struggle with broader struggles in society. For example, connecting the struggle for women's reproductive rights to the struggle for democracy, to the struggle for civil rights for all, bringing those forces together in the process of a particular battle. Winning victories helps weaken the opposition for the next struggle and builds unity for future struggles. And it helps shift the balance of forces in a progressive direction. Um, so I want us to propose a thought experiment. One of the ways in which our approach is a little different than some others on the left is that uh, we uh, give a greater importance to understanding splits in the ruling class. Uh, some people say, well, they're all capitalists, so they're all our enemies. They're all on the other side, so splits don't matter. We should be fighting the capitalists, all the capitalists, all the time. But just think, where would we be now if Mike Pence, terrible, awful, horrendous, stupid conservative though he was, had decided to go along with Donald Trump's pressure to, to refuse to certify the election? What would have happened if Liz Cheney, arch conservative though she is, one of the people in Congress who voted with Trump, more most of the time i think her voting percentage was like 92 percent voting with uh, trump's positions uh, but she understood and understands the value of maintaining the legitimacy of the system for stability for continuing profits for not um, bringing in chaos uh, if we didn't if those splits hadn't happened we could fairly easily be right now in the grip of full-blown fascism with many of us being hauled away to prison, with demonstrations and strikes outlawed, with elections being canceled, with more and more voting rights being taken away. Uh, that doesn't mean that we can count on so, such temporary vacillating allies on any other issue. We can't say, oh, there's splits in the ruling class, so this 
uh, the people who are on our side on this one issue must be allies in a deeper sense, not necessarily. It just means we're aware of those splits and take advantage of them and build temporary alliances to win victories that will shift the balance of forces. So I want to uh, talk about a couple of history lessons about fighting fascism in particular. Uh, we've learned in part because act of actual strategic mistakes that uh, communist parties made in different countries uh, in the process of fighting fascism. So this is an example of the unity of theory of pra and practice and the primacy of practice. Theory of theory is essential, strategy is essential. But the test of theory is actual practice. Does it work in real life? So we have to look at lessons from real life, from real history, to um, understand uh, sort of a battle on two fronts that we need to wage. So Germany in the early 1930s, the German Communist Party was one of the four largest parties at the time. and. Uh, they saw the Social Democratic Party, which was the biggest working class party, as the main obstacle to working class progress, saying, well, their advocacy of, of minor reforms um, gets in the way of the working class deciding on revolution. So we need to direct our fire at the Social Democrats. However, they, in the process, the Communist Party of Germany underestimated the fascist danger rather than uh, seeing the Democrat, the Social Democrats as competition, rather seeing them as potential partners in unity to stop the fascist danger. They, and they also underestimated how quickly and decisively the fascists would move once in power. So they didn't prepare for underground functioning. So that underestimation of the fascist danger um, harmed the movement. It, uh, it uh, prevented us from building the broadest possible unity to stop the fascists from uh, coming to power. Uh, obviously, this example and the other examples I'll give are oversimplified. Some social de democrats also saw communists as the main enemy, and uh, there was a social democratic police chief in Berlin who, who sent the police out to attack and break up communist rallies and marches. It wasn't that that, um, that competition and that uh, enmity between the communists and the social democrats didn't have any basis in reality. It was just not the main problem that they were facing. Um, so I don't want to say our mis the communist mistakes were the sole or even the primary reason for the victory of fascism, uh, but it was a factor and the one that was within our control. The German Communist Party was also determined, heroic, persistent. There's many inspiring stories from that time uh, of bitter struggle. Um, but that's so that's on one side, the problem of underestimating the fascist danger. The opposite error of overestimating the fascist danger was made by, by our party in the late 1940s and early 50s. We were correct in warning of and orging against and preparing for the fascist danger. We were preparing an underground organization trying to avoid the mistake of the German party. However, in the process, we overestimated the da danger of fascism. And as a result, we made some strategic errors. We sent too much of the national and state leadership underground this is my personal opinion, um, that it was correct to set up an underground organization, but too much of the leadership was shifted into that instead of into the mass political fight against fascism. For example, one thing we do not talk about when we talk about that history is that we actually kicked out members or stopped communicating with them if they were somehow deemed not reliable enough. And in some places that amounted to a majority of the membership. Uh, the idea was to strengthen us. We're only gonna have the most committed, most 
uh, most determined revolutionaries and will uh, slough off the others. But that weakened us at the very time that we needed all available forces. I didn't read about that in a book. I only heard about that one night after a state committee we were at uh, having a weekend retreat at somebody's house and afterwards some of the old timers got to talking and one of uh, two of them talked about how they had gotten the directive to cut over half the membership. Uh, we don't talk about that but that was a strategic mistake and so the party we were trying to come to grips uh, with the changed circumstances, but we ended up fighting with important allies rather than building unity. Uh, during the 30s and 40s, we had gotten used to swimming in the mainstream, to being a major player on the national stage, to being part of left-center organizations that involved millions of people. Those organizations were also under attack as was our party, and they shrunk considerably. So the party came to the conclusion that such left formations were a distraction from connecting to masses of people and fought to disband left formations, such as the National Negro Labor Council, such as our youth organizations. And we did so against the wishes of our allies in those organizations. For example, in the National Negro Labor Council, Coleman Young, who was a United Auto Workers organizer, uh, desperately wanted that organization to continue when we fought against him. He later went on to become the mayor of Detroit. So he was an important ally and we pushed him to the other side and weakened our position, cut ourselves off from allies and had to try later to reestablish such left formations. Um, all through the late 60s and early 70s, we put a lot of effort rebuilding a youth organization, rebuilding um, uh, uh, the left in the labor movement. Uh, we had to recreate what we had helped dissolve earlier. I don't say these to say we only made mistakes. We have much to be proud of during that period. We helped collect signatures, uh, millions of signatures in on the Stockholm Peace Appeal. Uh, we waged a several decade long series of legal battles to defeat fascist laws, ultimately successful. So we have much to be proud of, but we also made mistakes in the process. So these two exam these examples are why strategy is important and how strategic mistakes lead to defeats and setbacks. So part of the purpose of strategy development is to avoid both overestimating and underestimating our opponents, to take an accurate and um, uh, dependable read on what our actual circumstances are at the time, what the current political temperature is, not what we wish it would be, not what it ought to be, not what we hope it to be, but what it really is, the basis from which we're starting. For example, if you're living in Waco, Texas, and you do not have a large movements and lots of organizations, your focus is not going to be building unity between organizations that don't exist. You're going to say, how can I start collect connecting with people? How can I talk to raise awareness? How can I learn to meet more people and estimate what it'll take to get them to come into closer alliance? That's based on a read of what the circumstances are. If you're in Seattle, for example, where there's there are large coalitions, well-established, long running, your major focus won't be just talking to people because you already have organizations to work with that you're going to try and build unity with and between. So what strategy you pick depends first on that estimate of where you are really at. There's not any list of strategies that we can memorize and just uh, roll them out as needed. We have to correctly estimate the balance of forces and uh, fight for the divisions on our side and increase the divisions on the other side. So that's why one of the reasons, part of why strategy is important. And like everything, Marxist philosophy tells us everything is a process, that the only thing that doesn't change is change itself. It's not a one-time process that we go through and then we have a strategy and we never have to update it. 
the only way we learn if our strategy is correct is to put it into practice, is to implement it and see what happens. That's that unity of theory and practice. And the practice is primary because practice is the real world. It is the basis that tells us whether our estimate was correct and whether our strategy is correct. And it also, it's a process because as circumstances change, strategy must also change. So we have to ask the right questions. Uh, first, because what answers you develop are determined in large part upon what the question is. For example, in the early Trump years following the fascist demonstration in Charlottesville, there was a debate on the left you know, all over Twitter and Facebook. Is it moral to punch fascists in the face? And they had the little clip of somebody punching, I think his name is Richard Spencer in the face. And so is it moral? And you know, the obvious answer is, of course it is. Fascists have given up their right to be treated as normal political actors. But that's not the right question. If the question is how do we build the broadest unity against fascists, then punching individual fascists in the way can get can be an obstacle to building the broadest political unity. You turn off those people who are not yet ready to punch them in the face. Also, punching individual fascists in the face is not a winning strategy. In Germany, all the major parties had paramilitary organizations of ex-servicemen. They had pitched street battles. Plenty of fascists got punched in the face, but that didn't stop fascism. The fascists used such street battles, even if they lost, to argue that they were the only ones who could bring stability. So you have to broaden the question, ask the basic question about basic goals, not uh, questions that are fundamentally abstract moral questions, but real questions about our real circumstances. How do we build the most unity? And that, that answers the question of whether this is the right tactic or not. So the process of strategy development goes through steps. Make sure you're asking the right questions. Identify your long range goals, though you don't stop there. You identify the main enemies and main allies. Understand the splits on the other side. Understand the obstacles to unity. Understand the main issues under contention and how best to frame them to help build maximum unity and understand the stakes for each side. And this, this is, uh, these steps are not, are not scope dependent. On a national scale, you'd go through this process. On the local scale, you'd also go through this process. Um, I live in a small town, Roslyn, Washington. Uh, I inherited my parents' house. I moved here after they passed away. Um, but when they first moved here in the late 70s, there were no mass struggle organizations in our little town of less than a thousand. But there was a struggle over water rights. There were companies that owned water rights that, want, there, that wanted to buy uh, water rights and take them away from the town. So there's a battle for the town to um, bring in uh, to, to uh, what's the word I'm looking for, to bring into the city limits a swath of undeveloped territory of our watershed. So my parents had to go through this process. What are, what are the battles? Who are the enemies? Who are our allies? How do we build the struggle? How do we understand the stakes? And that was just a little local battle, uh, but one that they were ultimately victorious on. But whatever your struggle is, whatever the scope is, you need to go through this, a similar process to this, to develop a deep strategy, not oversimplified or a slogan strategy. This is not about developing slogans. This is about identifying winning strategies. After the strategy development process, then you need to go to implementing it. That's the whole point of developing a strategy is that you see if it works out in real life. And real life is what tells you, not, not uh, having a better quote from Marx or Lenin, reality is the teacher. We have to deep, deepen our understanding of all the pieces so that we can pay attention to what is changing and then we can readjust our strategy.
So that's a, a, a summary of that strategy development process. But it's not an individual process. It takes a collective to work through the strategy process. This is part of why we need a party. Uh, because a collective can share individual experiences of many people and create a better strategy because of those variety of experiences, we can have a deeper understanding of where we are at at this political movement. Strategy is not about brilliant ideas or insights. It's about figuring this shit out together and planning the work that we'll do together to test it out in real life. And that's a two-way street. Strategy development requires a collective to be deep enough. But going through a strategy development process helps to build the collective. That's how we learn to trust each other. That's how we learn to understand each other's strengths and weaknesses. It's how we learn to understand how to work together. It's how we learn to understand what it takes to build a winning strategy and to implement it. So all strategy is not separate from the potato salad question. It's not separate from who's going to be chair or who's taking notes or who's going to send out, um, you know, the announcement about the next meeting. All of those, all of these pieces, including strategy development, are part of building a collective, of building a party. So as we try and implement our strategy, we have to change it as the balance of forces changes. In the 1950s in South Africa, the Af African National Congress organized mostly nonviolent resistance to apartheid. There were mass protests, civil disobedience, legal challenges, um, uh, opposition to the past laws, refusal to cooperate with the apartheid system. And that matched their circumstances at the moment. They were in the process of movement building. But after years, or really decades, of violent repression and of the apartheid regime closing off one by one avenues of mass protests, in the mid-1960s, the ANC changed their strategy. They shifted to military opposition, to sabotage, to training for military operations. They founded a group called Spear of the Nation. I can't say the South African name. I can't correctly pronounce it, uh, but they founded that and they also launched international solidarity campaigns on a much wider basis. Uh, I will say, uh, just as a, a point of pride in our party, in the late 1970s, before it was popular, before freeing Nelson Mandela became a slogan, for a movement that involved millions of people around the world, tens and even hundreds of millions of people around the world. Before that, our party joined in and started campaigning to free Nelson Mandela before most people knew who he was. So we were early on that. We understood this was a way to build strategy, to build a movement, to build something much broader, and it indeed became that. And then again, in the early 1990s, when the apartheid regime's room for maneuvering shrank due to the ANC and popular resistance and to the international campaign and the economic blockade they were starting to suffer from, there was an opening for negotiations for an end to apartheid. So the ANC and the South African Communist Party and COSATU, they call it the Tripartite Alliance, the, uh, the, the uh, Union Federation, all shifted strategy to negotiating and getting ready to fight in elections rather than, uh, than continuing their military opposition to uh, the apartheid regime. So that balance of forces shifted not because somebody got a brilliant new idea, it shifted because the reality shifted and the possibilities for struggle in that reality shifted. So we see the balance of forces shifting. We try uh, to develop a strategy. We apply it. Uh, we see if it works. If it works, we continue doing it. And then as we see things shift, we shift our strategy. So strategy can seem like it's an academic question, but really it has to start with our real circumstances figuring out what is needed to shift the current balance of forces so that we can progress. It involves doing the work and adjusting as circumstances change. 
So I'd like to now shift a little bit to what our party strategy is. Um, so I'd like to open the floor for uh, people to set what you're, you're, if you're a member or a, uh, an ally, what do you, what does it seem to you like our strategy is? I'm going to go into my definitions in a little bit, but let's start with what you think our strategy is. Luke? All right. Again, looking for raised hands. Um, once I call on you, just unmute yourself and then I will unmute you on our end. Um, Craig Harrison, um, it looks like you don't have an option to unmute. Um, it says not connected to audio. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, Idrissa Sila, sorry if I mispronounced your name, but I am unmuting you. If you unmute yourself on your end, you'll be able to speak. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Um, Lucas, uh, your hand is up. I'm gonna unmute you. Luke, Luke, let, let me say, uh, this is D. If you want to speak, then uh, please listen. Use the raised hand icon, use the picture of the hand, click it with your mouse to indicate you wanna speak. At the same time, you can click the picture of the mic on your control panel so that you open your mic. Then Luke will call on you and open your mic on our end. I'm sorry, Luke, go on. And, and please, uh, include, please include women. Um, I think my hand up was from uh, a previous question, so I don't remember putting it up, so I'll mute again so someone else can speak. All right. Um, <clears throat> Moshin Sadiq, I am unmuting you. Thank you. Uh, oh, my question yeah, the, the, our, our strategy is based on our goal. The goal of the party is to create a socialist society in the United States that equals organizing the working class. So our, our strategy is to do everything we can bring class consciousness among the working class and organize them to create and, and fight for a, for a socialist United States of America. I think that's in shock, in shock, in shock about our, our strategies. Thank you. For sure. All right, looking for more raised hands. Um, let's see. All right, Carla, I am unmuting you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, I'm uh, assuming that one of the uh, strategies, uh, that, that a strategy for um, uh, the party would be to build a working class movement, to try to build political power for uh, working people, which I think in the United States, as a, a general rule, um, working class people have never really held uh, political uh, power or uh, ownership of the means of uh, production. Also, on an international uh, scale, I'm wondering, uh, I, I would assume also that it would be to uh, uh, oppose, for example, uh, conflicts that uh, have a capital as its uh, primary um, motivator and to, um, to uh, oppose uh, US uh, imperialism, capitalism uh, imperialism. Thank you. All right. I'm uh, going to take one more. Um, Lucy, I am unmuting you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> I think the uh, strategy that we em employ would be to, as a previous uh, speaker said is to build class consciousness among the various sects of the working class and to uh, appeal to a broad support among uh, the citizens of the United States of America. That's okay. all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Can we take one more? And then sure. 
Um, Rebecca, I am unmuting you. Okay. Um, yeah, I think one strategy that we need to focus on is kind of cutting through the culture war that's presented by like the two party system in the US because it's the same, it's just a divisionary tactic. So trying to cut through that and realize that we're fighting for the same goals as a unity building aspect. I think that's really important because ultimately, like when I talk to even the most MAGA person like in my life, which is my mom, it's still a lot of the goals that she wants for her life are the same as what we're trying to fight for, you know, mm -hmm. but she can't see past the culture war. So I think that's an important aspect in the US specifically. Okay. All right, thanks everybody. This has been, uh, these indeed are, um, I think what people are talk, have been talking about really are the goals of our strategy. This is what our goal is, this is what our aim is. So I'd like to go into a little bit uh, more detail about this. What I think of as basic party strategy is to build unity among the core forces, workers, oppressed people, women, youth, appealing to broad-based support, to build unity between movements, to actually look for issues that connect different movements together so that they can gain in strength from that unity and that alliance. In the process, part of the process of building unity between movements is to link issues and build coalitions uh, between movements and organizations around those issues. So we want to look for issues that uh, that help us build that broad unity and appeal to that broad support. Uh, we want to engage on every field of struggle that we can. We don't want to cede any field of struggle to the other side. Um, whether that struggle takes place on the job, in electoral struggles, in coalition building, in civil disobedience, in mass education, in legal battles, whatever. A field that is, we want to engage in that struggle. Our one of our main goals in this is to do, work to defeat the extreme right, who have a stranglehold on way too much of uh, our public policy. Um, due to, I mean, it's due to a lot of factors. I don't have to preach to the choir, you know, uh, gerrymandering, voter suppression, uh, demagogy whole variety of things. Uh, but it, it's not that we're going to uh, make them ever totally go away, but uh, break their stranglehold on so many state legislatures and on so much of the national um, policy debates. And the main goal of this stage of struggle of defeating the extreme right is to shift the balance of forces decisively, to move increasingly from defensive struggles to fighting for real solutions. And it's not that there's a uh, some kind of big wall between the defensive struggles and fighting for real solutions, uh, but when uh, the all extreme right has as much power as it currently does, we of necessity have to fight defensive struggles, fight for them taking away rights that we won long ago, taking away voting rights, taking away women's health care rights, taking away the norms of political functioning, taking away, you know, taking away some of the weapons that they are able to to uh, to utilize because of their posi current positions of power. So we want to shift the balance of forces so that most of our efforts and our struggles can be fighting for real solutions because um, while we can build massive unity in defensive struggles uh, to really make progress we have to build massive unities massive unity fighting for real solutions because that's what's really going to uh, fighting defensive struggles to stop them keeping away rights gets people angry but fighting for real solutions inspires people so we we need both and for us the framework of the fight for democracy is the framework in which this strategy happens for a number of reasons the fight for democracy links us to powerful struggles that have happened throughout our history the fight to extend the vote the fight to make civil rights 
apply to civil and legal rights, apply to all people. Uh, the fight to keep them from taking away those democratic rights, the fight for everybody to be heard, the fight for every vote to be counted. That's one reason. Another is that protecting even our limited democracy protects the ability to organize and protest. If they can uh, take away the right, uh, and let me give you a, a, a negative example of that. It's illegal in many circumstances for unions as part of a strike struggle to organize boycotts. Um, they've made that illegal. Well, that's a powerful weapon in our hands and they've taken that weapon away from us in many circumstances, not all, I and mean, we can still do boycotts, but there's certain prohibitions uh, that we could use it even more. So another reason is that protecting our limited democracy, understanding that it's limited, it protects our ability to mobilize people. If we can't mobilize people, if we can't organize people, if we can't demonstrate, if we can't be out in the public, that limits our ability to change the balance of forces. So it, that struggle for democracy enables us to build those kind of broad-based coalitions so that you can connect, whether it's women's reproductive health or uh, the right to for every vote to be counted or the right to unionize or the right to strike or the right to protest or um, you know any of these things can be connected to this battle for basic democracy it provides a framework for unity it places the struggles against racism and sexism at the center uh, because those are the main obstacles to unity it unites us with progressive but thus far non-revolutionary allies and it protects our ability to engage in struggles so why is this our strategy it matches the objective needs of the working class and our main allies. It connects us to the struggles and movements that have to come together for us to win a majority. It helps divide the most militaristic, most chauvinistic, most authoritarian sections of the capitalist class, in other words, those sections inclined to support fascism, from those sections of the capitalist class that prefer to rely on the legitimacy of the existing system. That's Trump versus Liz Cheney, for example. Both arch conservatives. Liz Cheney is, is no progressive hero, but she understands that if you, uh, bring the chaos that Trump brings, that brings the whole system into question, and that will lead to people drawing more fundamental conclusions. But as a result, she played a role in, play, and plays a role in the defeat of Trumpism. So it increases the divisions on our opponent's sides. Our strategy has the aim of shifting the balance of forces, and it enables us to build that big unity. So our goals are not picked out of a hat. Um, they're based on a reading of the objective needs of our class and the objective political situation in which we must struggle. As Marx and Engels said, we make our own history, but we do not do so in circumstances of our own choosing. The circumstances we struggle within determine the goals we can reach for. Uh, pushing the struggle as a way that helps shift that balance of forces. I'll give you an example. I've um, been in the environmental movement and I've written a book, which I'll put in a plug for, from international publishers entitled Green Strategy. Um, and there are some in the environmental movement who correctly understand that capitalism is the source of the environmental problems we face, most of them, and correctly understand that capitalism is also the main obstacle to reaching fundamental solutions. Some, however, stop there. They feel, feel they've reached the end of strategy development, that once we identify socialism as a necessary goal, as a necessary part of what we're reaching for, then we can stop and just argue for socialism. But these corrective under, correct understandings of what we need for ultimate solutions don't address, address the crucial strategic issue. How do we get from here to there? How do we together create a massive coalition that will create 
fundamental change. So this, this idea of, well, we identify as the goals and then that's all we need to do is a mistake. That's, that's the important early step, but it's not uh, a stopping point. And that leads to ultra left mistakes. For example, uh, in, 19, in 2014, uh, there was a People's Climate March in, in, uh, in New York City, uh, which I was able to attend. And we had a party contingent, uh, a very inspiring and uh, enthusiastic contingent. And right behind us was a contingent from the what they called the Revolutionary Communist Party. And they had correctly concluded that uh, socialism was a necessary uh, goal. So their chant was revolution, nothing less. That anything short of chanting for revolution was somehow um, reformist. Uh, and frankly, they're kind of silly because how do we reach people who are not yet ready for revolution? Do we attack them? Do we shout louder at them? Do we turn the bullhorn up the, all, all the way? And do we have the biggest red flag? This leads to attacking people who are the natural allies of a revolutionary movement because they are not yet revolutionary. And that's a self-defeating strategy. Instead, we need to work with masses where they are at to begin to create change, to begin to win little victories, to create, begin to create unity and to educate in the process of struggle. So our extended strategy, I mean, right now we're in this defeat the extreme right uh, strategy as the framework for, um, for all, all of our political efforts. But as we move from defensive to proactive struggles, and as the balance of forces shifted, our, our strategy will also need to shift. And we foresee that moving to a stage of an anti-monopoly struggle, uniting all in opposition to the monopolies, the oligopolies, and the transnationals. Um, and then when there's a further shift in the balance of forces, our class will then move on to the direct struggle for socialism. It's not that socialism isn't our goal, but we realize we're not gonna get there in one step. It doesn't just happen because it needs to and ought to. We have to understand the path to get there. Some of those uh, steps, by the way, may take decades. Some of them may take months. That doesn't depend on us. That depends upon the struggle and upon the majority of the working class and how they are organized, inspired, and uh, how they engage in in politics, because uh, we can't, if we just try and move to the direct struggle for socialism, we just because we wish it doesn't make it happen. The whole idea of strategy is to map, map out that path. The strategy is the path, the strategy is not the goals. And I contend we can't preach our way to socialism. We have to actually engage in struggle with tens of millions of workers who are not yet revolutionary and they will learn to be revolutionary in the process of struggle, not because we uh, talk at them or shout at them, but they learn in the process from their own experiences. Once they do that, our lessons and our preaching about the need for fundamental economic and political change will resonate with them, not because we're preaching, because what we're saying will match their reality and their new understanding based on their own experiences. So where do we engage in strategy development? As I said, it's a collective process. So it happens in all our collectives, in clubs, in leadership bodies on all levels, uh, city, county, state, national, uh, regional, whatever. All Any collective that we build put together has to wrestle with strategy. If it's not developing our basic party strategy, it's figuring out how to apply that strategy in that in a particular field of struggle. If it's in the labor movement, if it's in a little town, if it's in uh, people who are active in national political electoral campaigns, if it, no matter where it is, building a collective requires engaging in strategy development and to have that collective be effective requires strategy. And there is a place for individuals using self-study and our own experiences to guide our practice, our work, and to share that 
with the collective. So the collective deepens its understanding of the political moment that we're in. So thus far, we focused on strategy, but what about tactics? First, if you recall, at the beginning, I talked about tactics and strategy are relative to what's the scope that you're talking about. Are you talking about a national political campaign or a local political campaign? Are you talking about one union local or talking about uh, mounting a campaign to change the leadership of a national union? Or are you talking about the need to bring together a coalition of unions? All of those things uh, have strategy in, embedded in them and need strategy, but you, you first have to um, identify the scope and then you can talk about strategy because we can develop a national strategy that may not work in your union local. The specifics of your union local, the politics, who's a member, varies greatly. For example, I was a, a member of the Ameri uh, AFSCME, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, and we'd go to um, state union conventions, and all the prison guards were organized into our union, and they were a very conservative force, many of them ex-military, many of them very conservative, and we had to take that into account as when we were drafting resolutions that we were trying to get passed, when we were building coalitions between different locals to pass a resolution, we had to take that into account. Um, so. Your particulars matter. You have to identify the scope before you can figure out if it's, is it a strategy or a tactic? Because your strategy for your local has to fit in with the strategic concerns at a bigger level, even though there's differences. But tactics are not as major, so therefore there's more room for experimentation, for trial and error, for testing out different approaches. And third, the key issue is whether a particular tactic aligns with your strategic goals. Uh, and if it doesn't, don't do it. <laughs> uh, but let me give you an example. Uh, if your strategic goal is to build a broad movement, don't pick tactics that will create obstacles to that goal. So here's an example. In the mid-1980s, there was a solidarity movement with the people of El Salvador. There was a, a reactionary fascist-like regime. There was a revolutionary movement, the Farabundo Marti Liberation Front, which was engaged in a guerrilla struggle against the uh, ruling class. And there was an effort to build a movement in this country in solidarity. So there was a, an organization called the Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador, which had uh, a labor committee in our area, it had a labor committee of, of uh, individual labor, labor activists who tried to get resolutions passed uh, in their different locals. Um, however, it, there was, it was limited. It was a left appeal to uh, uh, union locals that had a large left component. It wasn't broad-based enough in our opinion. So uh, we noticed that there were now about, there were a number of major locals that had passed resolutions uh, against US intervention in El Salvador. And we saw that there was an opening to build a broader coalition. Uh, so some of us uh, put together a conference to found an organization based on, not on individual labor activists, but based on labor organizations that had passed uh, non-intervention resolutions. So we had that conference and uh, the committee, the labor committee of the of CISPUS uh, came to it. They saw us as competition. They thought we were trying to uh, compete with them and duplicate what they were already doing. Um, and we welcomed them to come to the conference. We wanted their participation. They were doing important and valuable work. Um, however, on their uh, literature table that they set up at the back of the conference, they had uh, a series of, say, of uh, resolutions from different locals that had uh, passed solidarity resolutions. And they had like about uh, a resolution that about 10 locals in the country had passed, which identified 
the FMLN as the revolutionary movement in El Salvador and uh, declared our, the, that local solidarity with the revolutionary movement of El Salvador. And oh yes, by the way, we oppose US intervention. Our contention was that to develop good strategy, we first had to have an idea of the scope and of the main goal. And our idea of the main goal was, even though it didn't sound as radical, what was more radical was to build a movement powerful enough, big enough, and capable enough of actually stopping the US from sending troops, which Reagan was, in my opinion, fully prepared to do if he thought he could get away with it. And we thought our job was to make it a, the politics impossible for him to escape the consequences if he did that. Uh, so we were going for that broader appeal and seeking to appeal to centrist union locals, centrist led union locals that were, whether they were radical or not, if they were centrist, they, they weren't going to express solidarity with the revolutionary movement. They were going to say, we shouldn't invade. And that was more radical because it had more of a chance of having an impact in the real world. Um, so that, that was, that was what the, the conference wrestled with. Ultimately, uh, we did not build a successful long-term organization out of that, in part because of the opposition of the CISPUS Labor Committee. Uh, but it brought up this question, is it more radical to sound more radical, or is it more radical to build a movement capable of having an impact in the real world? The reality was the people of El Salvador did not need us to identify who the revolutionary movement was. That's their job, that's their business. Our business was keeping the US from invading. That enabled them to do their business. Uh, so luckily, even though the US gave support to the repressive regime in El Salvador, um, they did not invade. The movement was strong enough to keep them from actually invading. But that was because it was a broad enough movement in my opinion. So we were we were trying to get our, our draft uh, sample resolutions were all about non-intervention and keeping the US from wasting lives, money, and uh, in in such a futile endeavor and a, uh, a militaristic uh, uh, approach to uh, what was happening in El Salvador. Our, our job was to keep the US out so the people of El Salvador could have their revolution. So this brings us back to my old example of the punching fascists in the face. Moral issues are important, but they don't take precedence over strategic considerations. Clear thinking about the most important goals and how to reach them takes precedence over how we feel or what we hope or over how we wish things were. So as I said, tactics are on a smaller scale, so there's more flexibility, more flexibility. They should make it easier to reach your strategic goals. They should not conflict with strategic goals. We also can't know in advance which tactics will gain a response from those we are trying to organize. Therefore, we have to keep trying new and different tactics until we find what gets the response we need. This is true of any struggle uh, we engage in. We don't go into those struggles with a guarantee of success. We go into them knowing this is a struggle we have to engage in and we have to pick tactics that will help us uh, take that struggle to a higher level. Uh, because tactics aren't a goal in themselves, they're just an effort to reach that next level of struggle. And tactics also being smaller scale are easy to shift. We can shift from one to the other if one doesn't work. Uh, it's not as easy to shift strategy. Uh, it takes major things as my example from South Africa uh, exemplified. Um, those, those shifts in strategy were not based on a brilliant idea somebody had or, um, oh, the leader of the apartheid regime said something a little different, therefore we're going to switch our strategy. Uh, they required basic shifts in the 
balance of forces, a weakening of the apartheid regime, an isolation of the apartheid regime, a weakening of it, weakening of it on an internal political basis uh, based on the math opposition of the people, based on the armed struggle that the ANC had been engaged in. All of those things were major efforts and over a decade or more resulted in a shift of the balance of forces. A tactic you can shift in a minute or a week or a month. Uh, and that's the value of tactics is that you can experiment. You can see what works and what doesn't. You can learn from the actual process of implementation, uh, which is brings us back to why this series of discussions that we're having to strengthen our collective ability to implement the party program. So in summary, before I open the floor for um, so, um, your thoughts and discussions and questions, strategy and tactics are relative terms. They depend upon the context. They need to be based on an objective collective reading of reality and a collective reading of the balance of forces. They, we see the struggle developing in stages, not fixed immutable stages, but shifts in emphasis of where the struggle is and where it's going. For example, uh, right now we see ourselves as in uh, um, a stage of struggle against the extreme right to defeat the extreme rights stranglehold on too much of our politics. We're not yet in an anti-monopoly phase. That doesn't mean we, we don't do things that are opposed to monopolies right now. It doesn't mean we don't take on international corporations by participating in international boycotts. It doesn't mean we don't uh, uh, do things that don't, we don't argue for socialism now. We don't, uh, we, we, we have to advocate for our ultimate goal of socialism in the current stage of struggle. But the current stage of struggle is not a direct struggle for socialism, even though we start to argue for it now. Uh, we, we, we will get there if we follow this path. Um, and stages of struggle are about shifting the balance of forces. Our tactics have to match our strategy, and we have to understand that practice is primary. Life and work are the test of how correct a strategy is and how well it matches the current political movement. So now I'd like to open the floor for your questions and comments. Hello. Okay. Um, Luke, are you here? Luke? All right, let's go to uh, the attendee list. All right, so the floor is open for comments and, and questions. So I'm looking for raise, click the picture of the uh, hand to indicate you want to speak. Um, and, and if you want to speak, you may as well open the mic on your end by clicking the mic on your end. And then I will call your name and, uh, and open your mic on our end. So Brandy. You're unmuted on our end, please. Un there you are. Thank you. Hi, Dee. Hi, Mark. Hi, Hi Luke. <laughs> OK, so I'm in Phoenix. Um, I've met you before, Mark. I'll get on with mm -hmm. my question. Um, new members of our party are sometimes uh, infatuated with Soviet Russia, revolution as war, and people power as white power because they're living under the current hegemony. Mm -hmm. um, so speaking of the idea of the scope and I like how you said idea of the scope and the main goal. So this, do we underestimate the scope of fascism in the current moment of what I see as cookie cutter legislation uh, from Orban in Hungary to Trump to the Biden administration also being obsessed with our new weapons field tested by Israel, all the things, all the money, just follow the money, the weapons. 
So in this in this anxious moment of pending third world war for some people, um, you talked about how sh take the anti okay taking it to a higher level. How should we as a party take the anti-fascist struggle to a higher level? And if you don't think it's the time, uh, what is your assessment of the situation? Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, let's. We're taking a few more, right, Mark? Yes, please. Okay, so I'll go to Brooks. I'm opening your mic on our end. Brooks, please open the mic on your end just by click. There you are. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to ask how you would define fascism and how you would apply that to people like Donald Trump, because I guess maybe I just don't see the correlation there or how it's, um, how it, maybe you have a different definition than I do, but okay. uh, for me, roughly fascism would, would, based on its Italian roots and definition, would roughly translate to trade unionism that's what I've seen, but I, I just want to ask you what, what you, how you would define fascism. Thank you. I, I, maybe you could just clarify, what do you mean by trade? You, I, I don't understand. That. Yeah. So, so fascism, uh, the def, it's Italian. Can we agree on that? Uh, yeah. came from Mussolini, other people, and right. it's derived roughly from the word fasciso. Um, mm -hmm. fasciso, uh, a fa a fasci was like a, a bundle of sticks. So it's a word yeah. kind of bundle of sticks, which is uh, why in the 1910s and 20s, trade unions in Italy were called uh, fascis, I believe, or fascios. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where it's derived from is the trade union. So I, I was just wondering how you would apply Donald Trump and okay. other capitalists to that definition. I, I, I understand your question now. Let's take okay, one more you. and then I'll respond. Okay. Thank you, uh, Brooks. Thank you. Um, okay. So we're looking for our raised hands. All right. Karina, I'm opening your mic. Open. Okay. Oh, there Hello. You are. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Comrade Bergeen, for your clear theoretical presentation. But one thing that worries me, and I probably will be booed out of this group, booed out of the party, whatever, <laughs> because I'm pretty new to this, is that uh, with the wage increases, of course, everybody has to have enough and not go hungry. But wouldn't there be a certain amount of counterproductivity? Because if the wages are raised so much, well, factory or place of production may not have enough money to buy more materials, raw materials or technology, and may not expand. And the result would be uh, layoffs and even and even more hunger. Or uh, the uh, business or factories or whatever would have to borrow from the government and exhaust the treasury, which is already in debt. Look, Social Security is already going under and there just will be more of a kitty exhaustion to help up sagging business and we would get into an even worse depression than would exist if the wages weren't raised. That's why I'm in favor of like a totally planned economy with wage and price controls totally by a democratic socialist minded government, like a total government ownership of everything and regulation of wage and prices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's, let's take one more, Mark. There's okay. one. Okay, okay. Very quickly, uh, Karamu, let me find your. Uh, oh, I saw your hand, I thought. Okay. Okay, go on. Your mic is open. You just close your mic, Karamu. Real. There you are. All right. Um, as you know, uh, back on the practical side of the house, we had an election here in Philly. Hi, Mark. I spent okay. a long time uh, since I've seen you. And um, the problem is a person had left the Communist Party and wanted to run for, for a council person. He didn't do too badly. He got 49%. But I always believe deep in, deeply that if he had stayed in the party, I think he probably might have won out. I still have a problem in the fact that uh, the opponent uh, was able to hold on to the African-American community 
the majority of the districts that the places he lost were in North Philly and Germantown. He won in areas that were um, are what were considered acceptable and fashionable. 77% um, of the population um, uh, is is white in Chestnut Hill, as as well, and that that he won, and um, and it had a smaller percentage of of African Americans, and most of those people have um, have PhDs and masters and that sort of thing. So would you would you say sit down and and from a practical standpoint, do we do we start all over again? Do we convince um, uh, someone to come back to the party? Would since the party obviously might not um, might not be that negative, um, I feel that maybe with the full force of it and with him being back in and standing up for that, he might be able to do a little bit better, even if he you know ran in the in the primaries again. What do you want to do? What would you do? And from a practical, <laughs> as I am a law. <laughs> okay. Well, I thank people for their uh, comments and questions. Uh, let me go through a few things of these. Uh, one, uh, yes, people people join us for all kinds of reasons. They get inspired by reading about previous resolutions, or they become enamored of of something, or they come in they uh, they don't yet have a sophisticated understanding of political process. And that's good. That's okay. We want them to join because people become revolutionaries in the process of struggle. It's not just millions of workers who learn in the process of struggle. It's us. And we develop as revolutionaries by engaging in our political work. And so whatever it takes to engage people in the actual work to get to win them, it's our job to win new members. Just because they join doesn't mean we've won them to our strategy. It means we have uh, we, we have an open door to, to win them and we, we have to step through that door. Uh, and when, uh, so that's one thing, when, when we talk about how to take the anti-fascist struggle to the next level. Uh, the first point I want to make is that there isn't a, a hierarchy of struggle. You know, there's 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 petitioning down here, and then there's building a union up here, and then above that is engaging in mass demonstrations, and then above that is civil disobedience, and then finally you, you just go up this ladder till you get to armed struggle, which is how it's it's usually posited. Um, but when we're talking about next levels, we're not talking about uh, an escalation up that. Up, up a ladder of particular tactics or particular ways of approaching the struggle. We're talking about how to broaden the struggle, how the struggle becomes more embedded in more millions of people, how more and wider unity can be built as we increasingly struggle for positive goals rather than just fighting defensive battles. So. The, the levels that we're talking about are not levels of one kind of tactic or another. It's levels of how broad is the struggle? How can we expand the struggle? How can we make the struggle about um, battling for more fundamental change? So that's when I talk about the levels of struggle. And the anti-fascist struggle is, uh, this, you know, gets, so getting back to the, um, I, I'm, the de my definition of fascism. Um, I, I I can't debate the uh, the uh, etymology, the, the the word construction of fascism. Maybe that was applied to unions too. I don't know that part. But fascism was really about building what Mussolini called the corporate state, uh, integrating directly integrating more parts of the government with businesses um, and repressing any efforts by unions or popular demonstrations or anything else, reducing the possibility for struggle against the steps that the fascists would take. Uh, my definition of fascism goes back to, uh, I'd highly recommend reading United Front Against Fascism by George or Georgi Dimitrov. Uh, one of the one of the basic books about strategy, um, and he defines fascism as uh, the 
open terroristic dictatorship of the most chauvinistic, most reactionary, most militaristic sections of the ruling class. It's not the entire ruling class, it's large sections of it which uh, are the most militaristic, most chauvinist, and most ready to use uh, naked repressive power to uh, maintain their profits as opposed to those who want to say, well, let's let's put some more money in people's pockets because then they'll spend more and then we'll make more. And that's a different section of the ruling class. And the, the fascist sections tend to be the ones that are involved in uh, basic things like resource extraction, uh, the production of military equipment, uh, the production of machinery, uh, rather than those who are more interested in the produ production of consumer goods and the sale of consumer goods. Now that's a gross generalization and you can find lots of exceptions. I mean, I'm sure the head of uh, Home Depot is interested in people having enough money to buy things at Home Depot and it doesn't stop him from uh, contributing massive amounts to Trump's campaign. Um, so it, these are not hard and fast rules. That's a, a rule of thumb, if you will. Um, but also the thing about fascism, which which uh, which Dimitrov talks about at length, is that um, it's not enough to oppose fascism. You have to start opposing the steps towards fascism. So. No, we don't have fascism now, but we do have steps towards fascism. And it's our job to fight those steps and to build unity and to broaden the struggle in the process of fighting those steps. So those steps include uh, efforts in, in, in some state legislatures to pass laws to make it legal to drive a car into a demonstration if the demonstration is blocking traffic and killing somebody. Uh, steps like uh, all of the steps at voter suppression and limiting the number of voters and limiting when people can vote and how they can vote, all of those things. Uh, all of those steps are precursors to fascism. They're the things that help set the stage. Uh, they're not the, uh, the victory of fascism. They're the little victories on the path. And we have to stop them from being victories on the path before we get to full full blown fascism, um, and that that's understanding that there are splits in the ruling class. As I pointed out, Liz Cheney is an arch conservative. She's very conservative. She's not an ally in any way, shape, or form on any issue except the base for her the basic issue of maintaining the legitimacy of the system. Now, I'm not interested in maintaining the legitimacy of the system. I am interested in protecting the limited democracy we have and finding ways to expand it. So our, our interests align temporarily for moments uh, in terms of a historical look at it, for mere moments, you know, a few years or a few months or, you know, a year here or there. Uh, it's, it's not a permanent alliance. Um, I had a, a footnote earlier on that said this was one of the mistakes of Browderism. Browder was the leader of the party all through the 30s and through the uh, years of World War II. And because there was an alliance on the international scale between the major capitalist governments and the Soviet Union, working class in power, uh, because of that alliance, he thought that the ruling class had uh, somehow morphed into a, a class that would negotiate its own surrender, that there would be just incremental progress towards socialism and we didn't need a struggle anymore because we were already capable of uh, relying on the capitalists to do their part in negotiating a better world. Uh, and as a result, he advocated disbanding the Communist Party and turning us into a, an education um, grouplet. Uh, that immediately ran up against reality, uh, the reality that people in the struggle, uh, it didn't match their circumstances. They weren't finding, they were finding that when it came to fighting fascism on an international stage, that we could have alliances with cap the capitalist class that did not carry over into any other aspect of our of political or economic life. Uh, so that was his delusion that, uh, 
you know, we we uh, we get to a point where we could negotiate our way. We could be incrementalists instead of revolutionaries. Um, that was one of one of his mistakes. Um, coming to the the question about wage increases and uh, isn't it in a sense better to be worse? Um, and this is a thing that comes up. You know, it does it doesn't open fascism make it clear who who's in power and why they're doing what they're doing and won't that lead to a clearer struggle the reality whatever you think of it on a theoretical level the reality is is it doesn't work that way fascism in germany was defeated by external uh, military force fascism in spain and portugal took 40 years to move on from if if it had clarified the issues and hence made the struggle more decisive it wouldn't have taken that long but the problem is not that uh, fascism doesn't make clear that uh, uh, how terrible the capitalist class is and what it's trying to do or sections of the capitalist class it's that fascism also restricts the ability to struggle it makes it so demonstrations aren't possible it makes it so organizing it isn't possible it outlaws all unions except government-run unions it uh you know outlaws boycotts and civil disobedience and uh takes away uh, what you can vote on. Right now, there's many Republican-led legislators who are trying to change the laws about popular initiatives being able to collect enough signatures and get on the ballot, restricting democracy in another way. And that's all to keep people from being able to vote to enshrine abortion rights in state constitutions. But they're trying, because that's their goal, they want to restrict democracy so that we can't get to um, passing those laws, which when they come up, as in Kansas, a conservative state, uh, passed overwhelmingly, um, codifying abortion as legal. Uh, so they know they'll, that's a losing battle for them, so they're just changing the rules because they can't win under the existing rules. So all of these steps towards fascism have to be fought. Just because it gets worse, doesn't mean it's clear for people. When it gets worse, people have to work harder just to survive and they have less time, effort, uh, uh, and commitment to engage in the struggle and the costs of engaging in the struggle escalate because fascists kill their opponents, fascists beat the shit out of their opponents, fascists uh, do things like crystal knocked where they uh, all of the the windows and all of the Jewish businesses in all of Germany got broken in one night um, so the cost of struggle becomes much higher uh, so the worse it is doesn't mean the better it is it doesn't mean it's better for the struggle reality tells us that uh, if that would work we should try it but we already know it doesn't work because uh, and part of what works is if you win a wage increase, if you win an increase in the minimum wage, if you win better working conditions, if you win the passage of a better law, those victories give people a sense of their own power and their own ability to make further progressive changes. It's that victory that gives people the confidence and their understanding of the ability. I certainly agree with your goal that to have, uh, you know, government ownership of all the main means of production, all the main means of distribution, all the all the main means of finance and uh, is is our goal. But we don't get there in one step. We can't go from where we're at to there in one step because how are people going to be convinced they can win it? If they can't even if we can't even win a $15 hour minimum wage, how are we going to win full public ownership of all major businesses? You, ha you have to convince people that they have power, and they only become convinced of that, as I said, not because we preach at them, not because we lecture them, but because we are with them in their struggles, and when those struggles are victorious or defeated, they learn lessons from their own experience, and that experience is the teacher, and we're just there to help shepherd the that teaching to draw a little bit deeper conclusions about the next stage of struggle. 
Um, and Karamu, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry that I can't give you any advice on what I would do on that. I think there's too much I don't know about the specifics of your situation. I think a 49% victory for somebody who's a radical is uh, it, that, that that is a victory. That's almost winning. That's coming damn close. And that's a victory to build on. And so the question is uh, how, to, how to build on it. And that's, I don't know the fill these circumstances well enough to be able to advise you on that. Uh, if, he, if that person is ready to come back into the party, that would be great. If they're ready to tackle the question of being a socialist and fighting for socialism directly, that would be great. If they're ready to say, well, uh, what, what needs to happen is we need to take a little bit longer to prepare to get more union locals on board to actively support my campaign. Then, then that's the step to take. Whatever the next step that our allies are ready for that will expand the struggle, build the unity, make possible going from 49 to 51%, that's the step to take. But I can't advise you on what those steps are. That depends on your collective assessment there of what's possible, what's achievable, what will advance the struggle, and what will expand the struggle. And uh, here are a number of tactics that we're going to try to reach that and see what works in the process of reality. A 49% vote is a victory, not a vic not winning the election, but that's winning damn near a majority of voters. So that's a very successful effort. Um, and so the question is how to build on it. And that may, there may be four or five different ways to build on it and trying all of them is what to do, in my opinion. So enough, I've been yakking too long. I think I've gone a little bit over my time, so I'll turn it back over to Dee. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, we will uh, take a break now until one o'clock uh, Eastern, and um, so we will set up for the next class. We will not disconnect, So, but, uh, but, all of, but those of you who are attendees, uh, can take a break until one o'clock uh, Eastern. Uh, and then those of you who are panelists, please stay on. Once, Thank you, Mark, for uh, the uh, opening the school and, and providing uh, much food for thought uh, in terms of the first class. We will remember you in the future uh, to help us uh, in uh, future classes. So thank you, Mark. But we, we do need to move on now to setting up the next class. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dee. I just wanted to I put up online. There's my email. If you want a copy of this slideshow, email me. That's markbrodine1.mb at gmail, and I'll be glad to share my slideshow with you. Thanks a lot for all your participation.